All right, uh, this is a closer look at telescopes. This talk is for people who have uh, already used a telescope or even foolishly considering getting a telescope, but more importantly are beginning to realize that simply owning a telescope means learning a bit about physics, whether they like it or not. So <clears throat> this talk is actually about obsessing about equipment because amateur astronomy is not merely about reveling in the beauty of the night sky and the wonders of the universe, it's about stuff. And there is so much stuff to obsess about, as Jean, um, as uh, pointed out, there are a great many different varieties of optical uh, tube assemblies and mounts. There are many combinations and uh, it can be difficult to acquire knowledge that applies to all of them. So rather than discussing in more detail every combination of mounts, I'd rather consider the body of knowledge of uh, understanding uh, telescopes and how they work at a more advanced degree by considering these popular, oh, well, actually some people have collected the whole set as their method of understanding them, but I'm going to try to do it this way. There are a series of statements that you may have heard by now thought to be nuggets of wisdom as far as amateur astronomy and telescopes are concerned. And I will be going through each one of these separately, but for now I'd just like you to notice the color coding because some of these statements I believe are absolutely true, some are completely false, and some are almost true, have a grain of truth, but they may be, or it's more complicated. All right, full disclosure, this is my telescope. It's a 25 inch and 20, and I've used it for 23 years. It definitely colors my opinions and understanding of telescopes. It is a ridiculously self-indulgent toy. In my, defense, in my defense, I use this for public astronomy. I've shown thousands of people things in the night sky with this, mostly at the RASC's public star parties at CARP. And I invite COVID survivors to come look through this telescope when this virus nonsense is over. Now, the whole point of having a large instrument like this is you use it to see faint and distant objects like this. Well, no, no, not that. That one's easy. This one. So this substantiates the statement that aperture always wins. And certainly, if you want to look at faint galaxies or distant objects 600 million light years away or further, a large aperture is, there is simply no substitute for it. However, there is a problem. This is the double cluster in Perseus. It is a beautiful object. My telescope can only show me that much of it. In fact, the magnification is so high that the cluster core looks like an ordinary star field. In other words, it's not possible to observe the beauty of the double cluster in a 25 inch telescope. The best view I've had of the double cluster has been through this telescope, 2.7 inches, which is to say that there is a fundamental difference between different kinds of telescopes, which is field of view. Now, one can calculate field of view using ray tracing. Luckily for us, there are two things to remember that hugely simplify the task of ray tracing for field of view. One is right on the side of your telescope is printed the focal length. The focal length tells you the distance between your lens or objective and where the image appears. So in this case, the image of the tree nebula is positioned to appear right about the focuser here. And the other thing to remember is that light rays going through the center of your objective are not bent, they go through straight. So that if you know the apparent angle of the object you're looking at, you can calculate the size that will appear in the image plane. And the image plane is where you would put your camera sensor or your eyepiece. So the point is, if you want to get a larger field, it's not actually enough to insert a larger um, a eyepiece of the longer focal length. That's not the limiting factor. The actual limiting factor is the diameter of your focuser. If you want a larger field of view, your choices are one, get a larger focuser, or two, use a telescope with a shorter focal length. And that usually means a smaller telescope. This also explains why so many amateur astronomers obsess about using two inch eyepieces, because the fundamental thing that two inch, uh, two inch eyepieces give you is the potential for a larger true field on the sky. Now, so that's the absolute physical limit, the diameter of focuser and your focal length of the telescope. But each individual eyepiece will also impose a limit and you can see what it is for every eyepiece. Thing is, take your eyepiece out of scope and look in it backwards. Look in the end that you never look through and you'll see a dark ring in the center. This is called a field stop. It's put there by the designer of the eyepiece to block off a portion of the field that the eyepiece designer thought the eyepiece could not render sharply. In other words, some portion of this. Uh, each eyepiece will have a different amount. In general, longer focal length eyepieces have bigger aperture stops, but not necessarily. There are some short focus eyepieces that have very large 
uh, focus stops, but they tend to be the ultra wide field, super expensive designs. However, this different fundamental difference in telescopes between field of view is the reason why I like to have a large aperture telescope and a large field telescope. And that to me, that fully justifies having two telescopes. Unfortunately, I have 12 telescopes. I'm still working on a justification for telescopes three through 12. Now, as a telescope over owner, you're often gonna be asked, what's the best telescope for somebody starting out? And the, the conventional wisdom is start with a small Dobsonian. They are absolutely the most aperture per dollar. They're easy to set up, they're easy to point, they're easy to look through. And you'll be able to see thousands of objects in an eight inch daub, which could last a lifetime. And I've been offering this wisdom to people for at least two decades. Unfortunately, recently, two of my friends within one summer of each other, both tried Dobsonian telescopes, and they both told me that they hated them, much to my embarrassment. Some people find Dobsonians hard to point and hard to track. The reason is because they never got used to the upside down and back asswards hand-eye coordination necessary to move a Dobsonian. Sometimes they couldn't even figure out where the handle was to move the scope because there is no handle. Also, adults sometimes find the eyepiece too low. So my suggestion is when suggesting people, uh, when if, you're, if, if you have a telescope and people are asking you what telescope should I buy, don't be too dogmatic based only on your experience. Oh, in particular, these people who didn't like Dobbs, they continued using altazimuth mounts, but at least one of them preferred this kind of altazimuth mount, which had these knobs called slow motion controls, which slowly, precisely, and very smoothly move the telescope in both axes and just leave them. Although uh, in this particular case, the uh, person didn't use a small retractor like this, they used a large Newtonian. So I suggest not being dogmatic to answer the question, what telescope should I buy? So as previously suggested, the best advice is to ask people to look through telescopes at star parties, in particular, talk to the owners of telescopes, because that's the best way to learn the ins and outs of their actual usage. And absolutely, join a club, borrow a telescope. At least one club in Ottawa has a telescope lending library. Related to the question of what first telescope device, people will often consider Schmidt Cassegrains, often abbreviated to SCTs because basically we're too lazy to spell the whole thing out. Schmidt Cassegrains have a very interesting property in that they are very versatile. And by that, I'd like to compare it to a Newtonian, which is not necessarily as versatile. A Newtonian telescope will place the image plane about here. And the way Newtonian focuses is by moving the eyepiece back and forth only about an inch. Now this person is attempting to put a binocular viewer in their Newtonian telescope, but a binocular viewer needs the focal plane here. There is no way to get this arrangement to focus unless there's complex relay optics here. Without relay optics, you often cannot even install a DSLR camera on a Newtonian telescope because the focal plane may be inaccessible. However, if you look at users of schmidt gassegrain telescopes, you'll see that they can mount off-axis guiders, cameras, spectrographs, and even the occasional espresso machine. And the reason for that is a schmidt cassegrain telescope focuses not by moving the eyepiece, but by moving the image plane. Clever optical trick. And most schmidt cassegrains can move the image plane in and out by anywhere from 10 to 20 inches, giving you the huge capability for attaching all kinds of nonsense, I mean excellent cameras, on the back of your telescope. And another reason why Schmidt Cassegrains uh, are thought to be very versatile is that at least one model of Schmidt Cassegrain can do this because it has a short tube and therefore low moment of inertia and relatively fast motors. Some people have modified the tracking software to be fast enough to track satellites. So whenever you see amateur video of the International Space Station, it's typically done with Schmidt Cassegrains. As far as I know, no other combination of optical tube assembly and mount has done this other than Schmidt's. Now, um, the refractors have a great reputation in the amateur astronomy community as being the sharpest. And this is generally true, but not always for the reasons believed. There is absolutely a difference in contrast between different telescope designs. And one of the reasons why refractors are thought to have more contrast than the telescopes is that we don't, they don't have an obstruction. And by an obstruction, I mean, for example, in Antonian, the secondary mirror and this great big ugly spider that sits in front of your mirror that you have to look through all the time. The real question is, well, how much does it actually affect the image? So someone has done the wave optics calculations for us. And this graph, it shows 
the absolute amount, uh, the amount of image quality that you lose for the thickness of the spider. And it turns out in my 25 inch telescope, it's about here on the graph. The uh, image contrast loss is extremely small. And even the thickest spider I've ever seen on a telescope, it was at most here, which looks worse, but it's actually only about a two and a half percent loss in contrast. So the reputation of the refractors over reflectors is not explained by the spider vein. So I would say, you know, do not get paranoid about the presence of spider veins in a telescope. Well, okay, what about the secondary mirror? The presence of the secondary mirror absolutely reduces contrast. And again, someone has done us the favor of doing the calculations. So the vertical axis is the image quality and the horizontal axis represents magnification. And what it shows, and each of these lines here is for a different telescope with a different size secondary obstruction. And what it shows is that low magnifications, all of them produce a really good image. And at ridiculously high magnifications, all of them suck. However, there's a mid range of magnifications, and this is typically what you would use to observe planets, and it shows considerable differences. The top line is for a refractor because it has no obstruction. The green line is where my telescope is. And you can see that I've lost a little bit of contrast with respect to a refractor, but not an enormous amount. The blue line is typically where most Schmidt Gasser grains are. This is a noticeable reduction in contrast from a refractor. And you can actually see this difference if you go to a star party and compare the view uh, with refractors and Schmidt Gasser grains at equal apertures. This red line here, considerably lower, is typically what you get for telescopes that are specialized for astrophotography called astrographs. And they typically have enormous secondaries because they have to do that to get even illumination of the image plane. But then astrophotographers use Photoshop and they're gonna be screwing with the contrast anyway. So they can completely make up for this lack of contrast from the optical effects. <coughs> A screwing, by the way, is the technical term for adjusting image properties. All right, there are other reasons why people leave refractors at the sharpest. But considering wave optics alone, refractors are theoretically sharper during equal apertures. But if you do the calculations, a five inch refractor is a little better than a six inch reflector, which is a little better than a seven inch SCT, which is actually a small advantage. In theory, refractors have a small advantage. In practice, the advantage is larger, but it's for other reasons than the obstructed aperture. So another reason why uh, refractors have different contrast is scattering. It turns out that the physics of light uh, means that a reflective surface scatters 16 times more light than a transmitted surface. So a Newtonian reflector, which has got two mirrors in it versus a high quality um, uh, cemented uh, uh, refractor can have eight or 16 times more scatter. Now this is not a theoretical difference. I have actually seen this in effect. This is the Pleiades Nebula and this nebulosity here is called the Brewster's Nebula. I have never seen it in my 25 inch telescope. I have seen it in a high quality four inch refractor. In fact, I was really confused at the time I had both of these telescopes set up in an extremely dark sky site. And I went back and forth between them trying to figure out why I couldn't see in 25 inch. And the reason why I couldn't see in 25 inch is every star image in the 25 inch had a halo around it, including the ones where the nebulosity really was. But in the refractor, only the stars that were actually near the nebulosity showed a halo and in the refractor the halo was not was not symmetrical in other words the scatter off the 25 inch mirror was completely swamping the contrast of this extremely delicate reflection nebula now in this astrophoto the contrast has been amped up considerably to make it look beautiful all right other reasons why refractors have an excellent reputation there's a difference in contrast but Sometimes it's because of stray light from ground sources. And by stray light, I mean light that comes into your telescope of an object you're not looking at, for example, a street light. It can come through your lens and bounce off the side of the inside of your tube and then, and then scatter into your eyepiece, causing what's sometimes called the veiling glare. It'll light up the entire image plane of your eyepiece evenly, completely reducing the contrast and sometimes making things invisible. Now in refractors, the solution is to add a ring baffle inside the tube that blocks off this diagonal light. Now there's a way of calculating how many uh, baffle rings are necessary. 
geometrically to provide what is called fully baffled. And if you see fully baffled on a uh, manufacturer's website, what they're saying is they have properly and completely baffled it. That usually requires a large number of internal rings, but even very modestly priced um, uh, refractors that have decent quality, but are not the kind of thing you buy at Walmart, like real refractors, but the absolute bottom line will still be fully, fully baffled. The situation in sweat gas grains is considerably different. Smith cast grain telescopes do have baffles, but they are tube baffles. But unfortunately, there are still common angles where light can come in to the telescope, bounce off the sidewall, bounce off both mirrors, and still flood the image plane with veiling glare. And you can see this uh, under the night sky that if you're looking at an object near the moon, a Schmidt gas grain will have noticeably lower contrast than a refractor. Newtonians are the worst because they are almost no ba never baffled. In fact, I've only ever seen one teles Newtonian telescope properly baffled. It was uh, built by Paul Boltwood, who was unusually dedicated to attention to detail. <clears throat> and I've never seen this amount of baffling in a commercial Newtonian telescope. Now, you may have also heard that there's no point using a bigger telescope on light pollution because they just suck the light pollution and they lose contrast. This statement is completely false. All telescopes produce more contrast and less light pollution, and the ratio between what a large telescope will show you in detail versus what a small telescope show you in detail is a constant ratio, no matter how much light pollution there is. However, there is a difference in how, it, how telescopes handle stray light from the sky. So this is actually related to the previous statement that refractors are the sharpest. There's a difference in stray light handling when the stray light comes from the sky. So here's an example. Here's stray light coming from the sky. Light pollution is light that comes from ground sources that bounces off the atmosphere. It lights up the atmosphere. Now, in the case of a Newtonian reflector, that light can, can, can go directly into your focuser and into your eyepiece without ever bouncing off of either mirror, not forming any part of the image. In truss tube telescopes, it's even worse because light can go directly through the open truss work into the eyepiece. And even if you're using what's called a shroud, which is a tube of cloth to convert the open truss work tube into a solid tube for the purposes of controlling glare, light can still get through. The shroud that I use on my 25 inch blocks out only about 75% of light. However, if you take these large telescopes out into dark, light polluted free areas, they seem to perform enormously better than they do inside the city because there are no side lights. And that's where refractors got the reputation of being so much better, or small telescopes got the reputation of being so much better than very big telescopes in light polluted areas because big telescopes tend to be Newtonians. And big telescope Newtonians, at least the ones that amateurs use, really do not handle stray light very well. All right, there are even more reasons why refractors have a great reputation. There are differences in holding collimation. Now, let me give you a little more detail about what collimation is. Collimation just means that the optics are properly lined up. When the optics are not properly lined up, it means that there's a tilt in some component. Now, there's no need to panic. You can always test whether or not your telescope is properly collimated or not by doing what's called a star test. Point your scope at a star, at a star and defocus it. If it's got a secondary mirror, the star will expand into a donut with the black circle in the middle being the shadow of the secondary. If you're collimated, it'll be concentric. If you're not collimated, it won't be concentric, it'll be offset, so you'll know. So the real question is, why bother collimating? Well, this is what an uncollimated image might look like. And when you collimate it, you get so much more detail and makes it so much easier to read those giant billboards floating out in space underneath the planets. So the question is, well, how often do scopes need, scopes need collimation and how many parts need to collimate? Well, it turns out that varies depending upon the design of the telescope. For refractors and maxitovs, they're collimated at the factory. If you see a bad star test in a refractor or maxitov, it's a warranty issue. Schmidt gasset grains occasionally need collimation, but only if you bump them pretty hard. And then it's only the secondary mirror that needs collimation. The primary mirror, because it's a sphere, doesn't, doesn't care about small collimation errors. In solid tube Newtonians, you must collimate both mirrors again when you bump it, say if you're transporting it in a car and you go over a really big pothole. But for truss tube Newtonians, both mirrors need to be collimated every time you set them up. And just a reminder, every time you collimate a telescope, you have to realign the finder. 
Now, a question is, how good does the collimation need to be? Because I've seen a number of people with uh, trust tube telescopes um, not collimate their, their, their optics as well as they could be. And the way I could tell is I would do a star test every time I looked at their eyepiece. I'm a closet collimation tester. So to explain uh, the possible sources of error, let me just briefly review how laser collimation works. A laser collimator is a, pre uh, a precision cylinder of uh, metal with a precision aligned laser pointer in it that you stick in your focuser and it projects a beam of light onto your uh, primary mirror. The first step in collimation is to adjust the secondary mirror so that the spot of light on your primary hits the very center. And then the beam will return, bounce off the secondary again, and then a land on the face of the laser collimator somewhere. And step two is to adjust the tilt of the primary mirror so that the return beam lines up exactly with the beam coming out of laser pointer. In practice, it's not possible to get the separation exactly to zero. So the question is, how small does the separation need to be? So I have done the calculations. Now, I'm comparing it this to the airy disk. Now, an airy disk is the theoretical diameter of a star image in a telescope as determined by wave optics. In a miscollimated telescope, star images will bloat. Now, I'm not being, I'm being simplifying a bit here because in a miscollimated telescope, a bloated star image won't be exactly round. But here I've done the calculations for basically double the bloat and 25% of the bloat. Now, this is significant. A double the bloat, you're basically losing half of the planetary detail you might otherwise see. And if you're willing to put up with that, and in many telescope designs, you need only get the return beam of the laser collimator to within a couple of millimeters. However, if you want, say, at most 25% bloat, it needs to be a fraction of a millimeter. Now, this is actually fiddlier than it sounds for larger telescopes, because for a 25-inch telescope, the focal length is three meters. So we're talking about aligning a three meter long lever to an accuracy of half a millimeter. And this amount of fiddliness causes many large telescope owners to not fully collimate their telescopes, which is why if you go to a star party and look through a whole bunch of telescopes, you can get the impression that the smaller telescopes seem to be sharper than the bigger ones. You may have heard that refractors are in lower maintenance, and this is absolutely true. For one thing, you know they don't need to be collimated, but there's also a difference in cleaning. And the reason is because refractors have hard coatings on their lenses, but reflectors have very delicate coatings. Now that means that you can clean a refractor using camera lens cleaning methods. But for a reflector, you have to be very careful. Uh, most people with small reflectors will take the mirror out to clean them. They'll stick them in their kitchen sink. They'll run all kinds of water over them and they will either not touch them at all or they will only use the weight of a sterile cotton swab to gently stroke the mirror. This is really a dangerous thing to do. And many people say you should never wash uh, a, a reflective mirror more than once a year. The situation is worse with larger telescopes because it's very dangerous to take the mirror out of the telescope and besides it won't fit in the kitchen sink. So what the manufacturer of my telescope advises is to wash the mirror right in the scope. So to do that I insert the sheet of plastic to deflect uh, the water away from the electronics in the base and I use two spray bottles one with distilled water and soap solution and another one with just distilled water and I basically spray soap solution and distilled water. I use about 16 to 20 liters <clears throat> to rinse it. <clears throat> this works. I do it at most once a year. I do it on a warm, dry day, usually at a star party. The process typically grosses out anybody walking by. But the point being is that in general, larger the telescope, the more fussy it is to operate the telescope. And large trust tube Dobsonians just have to be an, happen to be an example of that. All right. Now, this is a really important one. Um, that needs uh, a lot of detail to explain. Smaller telescopes are less affected by seeing. This is an observable effect, but the reasons why are generally not understood by everyone. It would be fair to say that smaller telescopes have fewer thermal effect. Uh, first, let me explain seeing. Seeing is a disturbance in the atmosphere that messes up the detail you see on the moon and planets. And in a smaller telescope, it's common to see a situation like this where the images, parts of it are sharp, but it's undulating. In a larger telescope, the image will be f undulating less, but it'll be fuzzy. And the amount of fuzziness will change from second to second. So this is why you may have heard about this thing called seeing cells, which are said to be turbulent cells in the atmosphere about six inches across. 
And a smaller scope would look through only one seeing cell, which explains the behavior you see. And larger telescopes would look through several seeing cells, which would explain the lack of undulation, but lots of fuzziness. Now, the problem with this is a complete mess. If you talk to meteorologists, they have no idea what the heck you're talking about when you talk about seeing cells. It's because astronomers just made that up based on the observation of what it looks through in different sized telescopes. So let's talk about seeing. Seeing is an atmospheric effect. It's caused by temperature differences and turbulence in the atmosphere. And there are two main sources in the atmosphere. One is the jet stream up about 11 kilometers. And the other is the wind shear in the bottom two kilometers in the atmosphere. Now, people who know this, some of them think that most of it is the jet stream. It turns out the jet stream contributes typically only to about 30% of bad seeing nights in, uh, in Ontario and Quebec. And the rest of the 70% is due to wind shear in the bottom half of the atmosphere. So here's a clue. If it's windy, there's a good chance this thing is going to be terrible. But that's not all. Turbulence and temperature differences can also occur from local heat sources, for example, from houses, from asphalt, from cars, from my bald head. In which case, these local sources of heat and turbulence are properly called ground seeing as distinct from atmospheric seeing. But the most insidious source of turbulence and temperature differences, which will mess up your planetary images, is right inside your telescope. Which is to say that often when people saying the seeing is bad tonight, it's actually because they have tube currents. Now, this is a, pic a Schlerian picture of a mirror in a telescope showing the fact that the mirror was warmer than the surrounding air. And what's happened is a turbulent boundary layer of air has formed with temperature differences in it. And this causes the light to be messed up in exactly the same way that a wind shear at two kilometers and the, and the um, jet stream at 11 kilometers does to your telescope images. So the question is, how do you know if the image in your telescope is a planetary image is wobbling all over the place because of bad seeing or because you have tube currents? Well, there is a way to find out. And the way to do that is to do a star test. Observe a star out of focus. When you defocus a mirror, you see a little map of your primary mirror showing anything in the optical path that might disturb it. And then deliberately disturb the air. The idea is that if anything changes in what you see, it's got to be local to your telescope because there's no way the atmosphere 11 kilometers up knows that you're disturbing the air in your telescope. So I did, I did this experiment with my 25 inch. I observed um, Polaris. I used this uh, optical tube assembly uh, airflow homogenizer. I believe this particular instrument I bought from Walmart Scientific. And uh, I took a really bad video of it. So I'm going to swap screens here and attempt to show you this video. All right. So what you're seeing here is the combination of tube currents and seeing causing all this woggling. If there is no tube currents you're seeing, this would be perfectly even disk of light. Now, at one point, now I've turned the fan on, you can see the pattern has changed. Previously, there were slowly moving wormy things, and now there are only large flickering things. This is actual atmospheric seeing because 11 kilometers up does not know that I've got a fan. Now they turn the fan off, you can see the slow moving wormy things returning. That's tube currents. Okay, I'm going to switch back now. So here's the summary when you do a star test. Basically, if you see a distortion in your side test of things woggling around, and it doesn't seem to understand that your telescope is round, it's true atmospheric seeing. Typically, true atmospheric seeing looks like a distortion that moves this is right across your aperture, doesn't swirl, moves quickly. Tube currents, on the other hand, seem to know that your telescope is round. They swirl and they move slowly. This has sometimes been called a can of worm appearance. Now, once you know visually the difference in the star test, what seeing uh, and tube currents look like differently, you no longer need to say, cut a hole in the side of your shrimp gas and grain and blow into it in order to do this test. You can just do it with the star test. Now, <clears throat> the reason why it's really useful to know this is because um, different telescopes have different amounts of tube currents. So let's consider a Newtonian telescope. So here we've got a warm mirror causing uh, turbulence and temperature differences and observe that the light goes through it twice. In a refractor, um, 
the light might go through a disturbed layer just in front of the warm lens. But inside the tube, the light pulls away from, because it's a converging cone, from the walls of the telescope very quickly. So there's very little in, uh, uh, um, disturbance inside the telescope tube. Plus, because it's a sealed tube, there are fewer temperature differences to begin with because um, the, the, uh, the heat gets lost more slowly uh, to the atmosphere. So it's not actually the absolute temperature of the optics that counts here. It's the relative difference between the temperature of the optics and the temperature of the air. So in practice, most people with refractors have never seen tube currents because usually by the time they set up the telescope, the lens is already cooled to the point where there isn't even a disturbed layer of air in front of the lens. Schmidt Cassegrain, the situation is a little more complicated. Um, you do get um, waves of heat coming off the, the warm mirror, but it is a closed tube, so there is less um, heat coming off the mirror than you'd see in an Antonian. However, in practice, most Schmidt Cassegrain owners will add a dew cap to their telescope and a heating band right here in order to warm up the, the corrector plate because corrector plates on Schmidt Cassegrains do up very easily. That causes a heated layer of air just in front of the corrector plate, causing exactly the same kind of mess as you would get in an Antonian telescope, but the light does go through it only once. But because you've got two sources here, in practice, I've seen that um, schmidt cassegrain telescopes also have tube current problems. Now, the reason why you want to know the difference between tube current and seeing is because you can't do much about seeing other than move to the Florida Keys but tube currents can be fixed. And there are two general solutions. One, just wait for your optics to cool. That's great for small telescopes, but for big telescopes, typically there's so much thermal inertia in the optics that it might take all night for the, the optics to cool. The other solution is to add cooling fans. And in the case of large Antonian telescopes, that yielded the great suck versus blow debate on the internet. And the argument there was, how do you actually put a fan on a Newtonian telescope to properly cool the mirror? So some people are saying, well, you should blow air at the back of the mirror. But other people are saying, no, no, don't do that. If you blow air at the back center of the mirror, it will differentially cool the mirror and cause it to distort its shape. And at least one manufacturer of high quality telescopes refused to put any fans into their telescopes for that reason. So other people are saying, well, don't blow, suck. <clears throat> but some people are saying, well, if you suck instead of blow, it's just going to mix air around the fan itself and not actually draw any significant amount of air past the, uh, the mirror. However, some people were getting good results with fans that were sucking air out of the bottom of telescopes. But those people were using telescopes with closed bottoms. And not only did the sucking fan circulate air around the mirror cooling it, it also disturbed the boundary layer in front of the mirror. So then people figured out actually the best approach was to blow air across the face of the mirror because it actually wasn't necessary to cool the mirror down to be equal to the air temperature. A completely valuable alternative was to homogenize the turbulent layer because even though there was a temperature difference, as long as the air was homogenized in front of the mirror, the, the, the disturbance of the tube uh, currents would be removed. If you're thinking of doing this to your telescope, I would suggest putting a filter in in front of it. Otherwise, you're going to be washing your telescope mirror more than you like. Now, here's an example of a nice installation of boundary layer fans on a Dobsonian telescope. But note that this was retrofitted by the user, not by the manufacturer. Sadly, very few telescopes these days come from the manufacturer with boundary layer fans built in. There is a solution for Smith gas green telescopes. What you do is you take your eyepiece out, you insert this device into your eyepiece holder. This tube extends through the tube baffle and up to but not touching the secondary mirror and it draws air in from the left here and blows it out the end in order to homogenize the air inside your tube and it exhausts it out through a gap here. I'm told that these devices work. You have to operate them for something like 20 minutes or half an hour and then take them out to observe. They work fine but I wouldn't recommend forgetting one in your doctor's office. All right so for factors are so good and why am I going on and on about them? Then why bother with other telescopes, particularly reflectors? Well, there's an issue of cost. A premium quality four inch apochromatic refractor on a premium quality go to equatorial mount on a premium quality tripod will cost as much as 15 to 28 inch Dobsonians or about the same as three to four 12 inch Mancasa grains 
or about the same price as one 22 inch Dobsonian. So, you know, you have to choose. Do you want to look at faint galaxies? You might be better off with a Dobsonian. Do you want the very highest possible contrast to use and money is no object? Well, perhaps you want a top of the line refractor. If you want versatility, well, maybe you want a Schwinn Cassegrain. Now, to be fair, there are um, reasonably priced refractors on reasonably priced mounts that perhaps cost only say four or five eight inch Dobsonians. So the situation is not that bad, but generally speaking, refractors are the highest cost per inch. And also they're simply not available in the largest sizes. The largest refractor I've ever seen for sale is a 12 inch and it costs about the same as a down payment on a nice house. All right, so here's a statement that frequently annoys me. Big Dobsonians are light buckets. Now that doesn't only mean that they collect a lot of light, the light bucket word is actually used as a derogatory term for large telescopes that cannot be focused sharply. And you might imagine, well, why can't they be focused sharply? Well, because some people don't collimate them. <clears throat> some people don't take the time to cool the primary mirrors. Some people don't wash the dust off of the surface or use a shroud that can properly uh, um, block out stray light. So large telescopes do have a reputation for having fuzzy images. However, I'd like to offer you a counter example. Now, I'm not an astrophotographer, so I have to tell you the story instead. I observed uh, uh, the motion of Io and Europa in uh, 2009 and the wee hours of the morning at Starfest. And they were getting closer together. I was using about 200 power and I thought, wow, the seeing is really good tonight. So I decided to increase the power. I was gonna go for about 350, which is the highest magnification I was ever able to use previously in Ontario. I put a bino viewer in and I misconfigured the Barlow and I accidentally used 1200 power which is absolutely ridiculous. However, as uh, Io and Europa came together, I saw this. I actually saw Io cut out this moon-shaped cut out of Europa and I saw the color difference. That means that I was seeing detail on the order of one quarter to one fifth of an arc second, which I know because I used the diameter of Io as a measuring stick, which is 1.2 arc seconds at the time. Now that means that if you properly set up a large telescope, which is usually in the Tonian reflector on the Dobsonian mount, they can be fantastic planetary telescopes, but you have to get all the details right. All right, Dobsonians are no good at astrophotography. This statement is almost 100% true. A better statement would be some scope designs are better for astrophotography, or at least some scope designs are preferred by astrophotographers. So in a manual tracking Altas mount, you may, aside from the problem that you might have difficulty attaching the camera, they're really suitable for short exposures as previously mentioned. Now I did manage to take a photograph of the moon through a, uh, an Altas mounted uh, telescope. Uh, this is it, I actually took this picture. It's one of my only astrophotographs. And I really hate it because if you, if you pixel peep on it, you'll see that it's really quite smeared because even though I used a very short exposure, they're still rotated in that interval. So you can take pictures with Altas mounts but there's really no way to improve your skills with them. Now it is possible to add uh, equator uh, to add uh, tracking to any Altaz telescope by putting them on an equatorial table. Equatorial tables are very clever devices that rock your telescope back and forth and they sort of synthesize an imaginary rotation axis which if you've lined up with the celestial pole will give you perfect tracking but the problem with that is perfect most equatorial tables do not come with any kind of finder arrangement to allow you to pull or align. Typically what people do is they observe the eyepiece and when they see it drifting, they kick the equatorial table. This is not a precision process. And as far as I know, no astrophotographer has ever produced good results with an equatorial table. Now, no, there I'm are- i to interrupt uh, for a second. Just want to let you know, you've only got about two, three minutes left and we do have two questions uh, pending. Oh, crap. Uh, okay, I'll try to speed up. So, um, so as mentioned, um, dr driven Dobsonians have this problem with Im image rotation. Here's an example. There's no way to get around it. Most people like schmidt cassegrains for their versatility. Um, also, some of our schmidt cassegrains are very intelligent, and the computer can tell you how to move the telescope to pull or align it. But uh, most astrophotographers, as you know, will choose to use a high quality but very small refractor on a huge mount to get absolute high stability. However, there is one counterexample. This homely looking beat up telescope took this picture, which is to say that Dobsonians really can be fabulous astrophotography machines, provided your mic works. Now the last one, buying a big telescope will cause your sanity to be questioned. I believe this is completely true. 
Here's a 36 inch and it's right in the name of the owner, Crazy Bob Summerfield. But the craziness doesn't end there. Uh, the people, there are people with 40 inch telescopes, people with 48 inch telescopes. And this is the largest telescope I know of in amateur hands. It's a uh, 70 inch uh, Dobsonian reflector of a very unusual design. I think it's so unusual that it deserves to have a name specially uh, for the design. And I propose calling it the divorce scope. However, I've observed that buying any telescope, even a small one will have your uh, sanity questioned as per this iconic crazy person. So I suggest dealing with your detractors this way. Wait for the virus thing to be over. Set up your telescope on a steady night. Show them Saturn. Even on a small telescope, Saturn impresses just about everybody. And your detractors will realize that owning a telescope isn't about being crazy. It's about appreciating the beauty and the wonder of the universe. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Adela. And just to let you know, the next speaker, uh, Jim, has uh, offered to allow you to spill a little bit into his time uh, to, uh, to answer these uh, questions. We have two questions online. The first one actually uh, it may be a, rem a leftover from the previous talk, but uh, perfect, you're the perfect person to answer it. Um, David is asking with reference to schmidt cassegrain models from Celestron that refer to being coma-free. Can you explain what that is? Uh, yeah, so first you need to understand what coma is. Coma is a defect in the, in the uh, star image that occurs in many telescopes away from the center of the field. It causes the star images not to be pinpoints. This also happens the center of the field if you're miscollimated. So Lestron came up with a modification of the schmidt cassegrain design that removed the coma from the entire field because previous designs had non-circular star images near the edge of the field. So they charge more for that. It's a better telescope. Mead has a similar design. Thank you, Attila. And here's the other question. It's just a tiny question. It'll only take you a minute to answer. What is the advantage of a large aperture telescope? Ha. Huh. <laughs> well, aside from having your sanity question, uh, a large aperture telescope will, in our, all circumstances, show you objects that are fainter and will show you more detail on them. So if you want to see, for example, faint galaxies, or if you want to see detail inside the great red spot, of uh, Jupiter, a large aperture is the way to go. But as I mentioned in my talk, you need to get, you need to dot your I's and cross your T's. You have to get the collimation right, the thermal properties of your, of your mirror right, the cleanliness of your mirror, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a major fuss factor. 